Hello, good morning, City Hope, and welcome to our online service this morning. Hello, Rebecca. Good to see you. How are you? Morning, Kwame. I'm very well, thanks. And how are you? Things have changed a bit in your household lately. Yes, yes, yes. Now we've got our little Solomon. Such a joy to have him. And we're doing really well. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. So what have you got for today? So this morning we're going to have worship with our fabulous musicians, as usual. We've got a testimony coming up from Ian Geary, which is great. And we're going to hear from John Greenway, who's going to continue with our Corinthian series. And one more thing, mm. kids, oh. with only five more Sundays till Christmas, today we're going to start a Christmas competition. So I want you to watch out very carefully this morning. At some point, somewhere on this stage, you will see a Christmas item. The first child in year six or younger to text me telling me what it is and where it is will win a prize. So watch out carefully and take note of the number that's coming up on the screen now. I'm going to be watching my phone for that first text. Wow, sounds really exciting. I really hope Solomon gets it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we, we start, uh, Anna Bianca and her friends are going to give us some show. God, we praise you for everything you do in our lives and we worship you for what you are. God is our true Ila. Amen. The one who provides everything. Infinite, endless, limitless. You are our Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. You, God, are my banner. Father, you are so good. You are our comforter. You are mighty and strong. The God of peace. Your holiness is unique. Our God is omniscient, all-knowing. My word is transcendent. My God is transcendent. It means He is beyond anybody's comprehension. It exceeds our own expectation, and it does things beyond our own limit. God, you are the great I Am. You, you are, are love. Immutable, perfect, unchangeable. God, you are omnipotent. Nothing is impossible for you. You are the one who sanctifies. God is wise, acts with perfect wisdom. Lord, you are just. We trust in you. You are faithful.
66 says, Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. And we welcome you here, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would come and receive all the honour, all the glory and all the praise this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. your holy name. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We thank
thank you for a wonderful time of fellowship at your presence. We thank you for the assurance that comes in your word that you inhabit in the praises of your people. We pray, O Lord Father, that as our praises goes on to thee, thy blessing will come upon us. We pray, O Lord Father, that we will be partakers of every blessing that comes with fellowship in your presence, every blessing that comes with hearing your word with faith. Help it to dwell mightily upon us today so that we will return all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen.
child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God Good morning, City Hope. It's really great uh, to be with you again here this morning. You know, at the beginning of this term, um, God really spoke to me and uh, he gave me an image of a pile of shoes, um, a bit like this one here that you can see. You know, all the shoes were very different um, and yet they were all kind of together um, in this picture. You know, in this very different season that we find ourselves in right now, uh, we're not able to meet together as a church. But the one thing that we can do is to walk with one other person. And I just really want to encourage us as City Hope to be doing that. You know, Jesus commanded us and encouraged us um, to walk with him, to walk closely with him through our Christian faith ever since we were saved. Through this very kind of uncertain time and during lockdown, I want to really encourage you to be walking alongside other people, whether that's physically, if you're able to, or whether that is by calling people or texting people or sending them a card, that actually we would walk through life uh, with authenticity, kind of encouraging and uh, stirring one another in our faith. You know, in that picture, all the shoes were also very different. And perhaps it's time for you to change your footwear in this season. For some of us, maybe we've been wearing slippers and being a bit too comfortable during this season. For others, others of us, we've been running in our, our trainers and our running shoes. You know, perhaps God is, is stirring you also to put different shoes on in this season as well. And I would really encourage you too to walk with others in City Hope who are different to you, who are perhaps wearing different shoes. You know, we are called to be a family. We are called to encourage one another. And Jesus says, um, in Ephesians 4 verses 1. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live, walk in a, in a manner, a life worthy of the calling you have received. And that is what Jesus wants us to do in this season, that we keep walking closely with him, intimately with him, but also that we very much walk with one another. So as I've been chatting, if someone has come to mind that perhaps um, you've not got to know before and you'd like to reach out to them, then please pick up the phone and ask them to go for a walk with you this coming week. City Hope, bless you, I miss you, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Father is who you are, is who you are.
So, Ian, thank you for joining me. Um, I think it must be 12 years since I've known you. And I, re I remember back then, you, you managed to get me to speak to a group of MPs in the House of Commons, um, amazingly. Who'd have thought I'd do that? But t tell us a little bit about your political involvement. How did that come about? I remember, I remember that moment, Paul. So I became interested in politics at... Really an odd age, really, I think 14. And it was about... Very young. Quite young. And I remember, um, carefully I say, it's growing up, uh, I remember the, the, I was very um, aware of the miners' strike going on and Margaret Fletcher was Prime Minister and one either had... It's impossible not to have an opinion. And at that time, there's a lot of change, a lot of transformation in, in good and bad in, in many ways. And I just remember being very politically alive at that time, talking to people. And I would talk to my grandmother about her experiences uh, in, in, prior to the war in the, the 1930s and the challenges that people in some parts of the country faced and leading to the foundation of the welfare state and, and the NHS. And really, that's very much been part of my story. And around that time, around when I became 14, I became a Christian, which... Right, so you've, so yes. first you've got a, an interest in politics and then you've become a Christian as well. So you, you, you're a believer who's still interested in politics. Yes, and very much the, the story of my life has been really working... My discipleship as a Christian uh, has been a journey, and one significant part of that journey has been this vocation, this calling to be involved in politics at various different levels and at various times. So tell us a little bit about that. What, uh, what levels have you been involved? Well, the, um, I did a politics degree in, at university, and I was sort of involved in some of the political societies there. But it was um, after the 1997 election, I really wanted to work uh, in Parliament and I was able to work for an MP, uh, which I learnt an awful lot about the practicalities of politics rather than the theory uh, and how it can help people. Uh, and then I went on to work for a trade union, and that was very interesting, political consultancies, uh, and then involved in one of the Christian bodies, Christians on the Left, which is affiliated to the Labour Party. And after working for Stephen Timms, who's a very strong Christian MP, who uh, represents East Ham constituency over the river. And have you ever considered being an MP yourself? I did once. Yeah, I did stand uh, in 2001 and I stood for council um, about 18, 19 years ago. Uh, but that's kind of very much been on the back burner recently. But it was an enjoyable experience. So how, how do you feel your politics informs your Christianity and your Christianity informs your politics? Well, I think... Um, in terms of um, the Christianity is obviously is, is, is the foundation. And I think if you're reading, I think Colossians, it talks about God is restoring all things to himself. And I think all things 
is really important. God is interested in all things. He's interested in economics, politics, sport. There's not an area of his creation he's not interested in. And he's actively, he wants us to be actively involved in the world. And for some people, that will be in, in politics. And, and I think it gives you a sense of uh, service and accountability and integrity. And I think in terms of politics informing the faith, uh, not entirely sure, but I think it forces me to reflect, reflect politically on my faith, and particularly now, uh, praying for the American election, and really praying, although I have an opinion on where that outcome should be, we really need to pray for peace and healing for the, for the US, and I think, I mean, that, yeah. it, to me, that's really critical. Yes. Just as we draw to a close, some, some, some closing comments, Ian, well, well, from thank, you. Sorry, Paul. Um, so where I'm at at the moment, God's been really speaking to me over the past couple of years um, about 1 Kings 18, which talks about Elijah, and Obadiah. And uh, Elijah is, the, I think, to me, represents the, the prophetic, unbeholden voice of the church, speaking to the powers, speaking to the king. Uh, and and uh, there's a politics of the church that I think hasn't been fully unpacked. And Obadiah in the story is doing good within a political system. And I think we need to affirm anyone, anyone, politicians, nurses, lawyers, street cleaners, serving in the world, serving God's purposes for the common good in the, in the world, and I'm hoping to very soon put in an application to the PhD in theology that will unpack some of the themes in more detail, reflecting on my experience. Fantastic. I look forward to reading that. Christians should be active wherever they are, whatever the workplace, whatever the context, should Absolutely. They? Ian, thank you so much. It's been fascinating spending this little bit of time with you. Oh, thanks so much, and welcome to this morning's updates. Yeah, as I said earlier, with only five more Sundays before Christmas, here's a video from Chris with some special news about an upcoming Christmas special offering. We live in a globalised world, meaning that the struggles and the pain of many people right across the world are playing out right in front of us. There are so many countries and people groups that are in desperate need for help and attention. So as Christians, how do we respond to this? Well, we can either become so overwhelmed by the needs in the world that we shut off from them, pretending that the problems just don't exist, or we give up thinking that we could possibly make a difference. Or we can find ourselves so overwhelmed with the pain and hardship of other people that we end up getting frustrated and angry that we're not or we can't do more to help. However, the truth is, Though we can't help everyone, we can play our part in helping in a few situations. As we approach Christmas this year, we don't want to bury our head in the sand, pretending that there aren't any problems in the world. But nor do we want to drown in a sea of hopeless despair and frustration. What we would love to do is ask God to use us where possible to offer some help in a few situations. So on Sunday the 6th of December, we're going to hold a City Hope Christmas special offering. This will be a great opportunity for City Hopers to use some of the resources that God's given us to serve and bless a handful of communities that could really do with some support right now. There are three situations in particular that we would love to support as a church. Firstly, our Catalyst Hub is looking to raise money for light, the Lighthouse Church in Izmir. I'm sure you're aware that they suffered a terrible earthquake there just a few weeks ago. The Lighthouse Church finds themselves in the thick of the action, helping and supporting people in the city who have lost their homes, their loved ones and places of work. As a church, they've been supplying food, wood for fires, warm clothing for people whose homes have been utterly destroyed and who are currently living in tents. The second thing we'd love to help out with is Hope for Communities, Sharo and Lex's uh, charity in Kurdistan. They've had some great opportunities opened up to them in recent weeks. They're continuing to work into the, uh, the camp, offering uh, schooling and karate classes. The local schools have been closed for a while because of political reasons. But they've also been invited to work in five orphanage right across the region. With this come some logistical issues. 
they've got a growing team and they need to take Asa and Alana around wherever they go because their school's shut. And it means they could really do with another vehicle to get them around. And between City Hope and a few other churches, I'm hoping we can raise around £8,000 to help them get a new vehicle. And finally, this year we want to send out the biggest amount of cap Christmas hampers ever. At least 50 will be needed. Most other years people are asked to donate food and gifts to this, but this year it's going to be a lot easier if we can buy all of these things centrally. Most of the time when people receive a cap hamper, it comes as a complete surprise and it brings real blessing to their household. They are an incredible way for the church to demonstrate the love of Christ to people going through the toughest of times. So this December, we would love to hold this special offering to give City Hopers an opportunity to bless these really important ministries. More information about this will be coming out over the next couple of weeks, but it would be great if you could prayerfully consider what you might want to contribute to the Christmas offering this year. Thanks, Chris. Coming back to today, we have our regular City Hope prayer meeting tonight from 8 p.m. on Zoom. Check your inbox for the link and join us. We will be praying together for lots of things, but also we have a special guest in the form of Phil Green, who has recently taken over as the CEO of Mission Housing. Great. We'll see you tonight for that. And a reminder, there's no City Kids Zoom meeting today, but do remember, parents and children, we have asked for your suggestions of how we can provide materials and meetings for City Kids going forward. So don't be shy. Do send in your thoughts and suggestions to hello at cityhope.london. And remember, at the end of the service, there will be the reminder of all the updates on a slideshow. Great, thanks Kwame. And it's nearly time for John to come and give us the next instalment in our preaching series on 1 Corinthians. But before that, here's this, Curator's Corner. Good morning, City Hope, and welcome back to Curator's Corner, where we explore the real world of the New Testament. I'm joined once more by Xenia. Good to have you on the corner, Xenia. <laughs> Last time you told us about the city of ancient Corinth, can you tell us a bit more about what it was like to be a Christian in that time, in that place? Sure. So Christians would have been practicing their faith as one of many different faith communities in ancient Corinth. So as well as the kind of normal pantheon of Greek and Roman gods. Uh, so pantheon means all the gods in ancient Greek. Um, uh, you would also have a strong Jewish community, pretty much every major uh, city in the ancient world already had a Jewish community. Uh, and you've also got various different cults that are imported from different parts of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Remember we said last week that this was a hotspot for trade, so you've got lots of people passing through. Well, they bring their religions with them. Uh, and can you tell me more about the Christian community? How did they get together? Uh, what was the vibe? <laughs> so, uh, the, so Christians usually kind of emerged out of the existing Jewish community. Um, however, Sometimes that wouldn't go down too well with, with the rest of the Jewish community and there, in Acts we find out that there were quite a few arguments in the synagogue. Um, so if, uh, if the new Christians weren't welcome in the synagogue or actually if they wanted to include Gentiles in their meetings as well, um, then they would meet at a house church. Ooh. So we actually, it's amazing, we actually know who ran the house church in Corinth. Uh, they're named in Acts. They're a couple, a married couple, called Priscilla and Aquila. Fantastic. Uh, and how did the Romans react to all these different faith groups and the new Christian insurgents? So the Romans were very tolerant of different religions as a general rule. Um, it was actually part of their tactic uh, for maintaining stability in lands that they conquered. Remember, the Roman Empire was expanding all the way up until AD 117, and at this point, we're only in AD 50, so they've got a lot more growing to do. <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, they, they would normally kind of let people get on and do their own thing uh, as long as they weren't causing any problems. It's after about AD 64, when the Emperor Nero blames Christians for the great fire at Rome, that we start seeing persecution of the Christians happening. 
So you said Christians met in homes, mm. and did that affect the way they interacted with each other? If house churches are meeting in the domestic setting, that creates a very egalitarian environment. You don't, you don't have a hierarchy. You know, how, how could you possibly have a hierarchy? Most people are only just learning about who Jesus was. Um, so you get all these people meeting together, usually sharing food together, learning together, and sharing the faith together in a domestic setting uh, that has a very kind of egalitarian, familial feeling. Flat management structure and working from home. <laughs> Sounds pretty familiar. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senia. That's all we've got time for this week on Creator's Corner. Take care and enjoy the rest of the service. Bye. Bye. Before John comes to speak, I'm going to read some verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7. We don't have time to read it all now, but please do read it yourself at home. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such commitment? Do not look for a wife. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. I now want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Thank you, Sharo, and a very big and warm welcome to you this morning. I think these online services are fantastic, but we really miss being all together on a Sunday morning. And if you're not a, a regular City Hoper, you'd be rather surprised with the range of folk that we have here at City Hope. We come from over 35 different nations. We're a hodgepodge of every age and colour and socio-economic background. Some grew up in poverty. So others were brought up in privileged, uh, uh, well-off families. Some have served time in prison and others have worked in the Prime Minister's office, though not necessarily the same people. Uh, some have been addicted to drugs and alcohol. Others just drink Earl Grey. Some lean to the left and others to the right. Some support Arsenal and others the Spurs. Uh, some have been brought up in Christian homes, others in Muslim homes. And some have been Christians for 60 years and others just a few weeks or months. And the great thing is we are one family. We're one family in Jesus. And there's no way this could be possible if it wasn't for Jesus. Because it doesn't matter where we come from, but who we are going to that counts. That's the good news of Jesus. He says that we're not an accident. We don't live on this earth by random chance and have no purpose. He says that you can call on the all-powerful God and call him your father, our father. That you can come to know him personally and forever. God has revealed himself in many, many ways. You just look at a star or a leaf or a bird. He made each one uniquely. Look at another person. That person is made in the image of God. And even though that image may be broken, you and I were made in the image of God. And we too have been broken by our sin, by our wrongdoing. That's why the world's a mess. And that's why God sent his son, Jesus. 
Jesus fully reveals who the Father is. Jesus was cruelly beaten and brutally crucified on the cross for our sakes. He died in our place. He took our punishment so that we could be completely forgiven and start a new life. And he rose again to give us a sure hope of eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus that binds us together. Crazy, I know, but it's true. And all of this is in the Bible. And the Bible's like no other writings. It tells things as they really are. It doesn't idolize people. It's full of messy stories because people, you and me, make a mess. And one of the messes in the Bible was at the church at Corinth in Greece. And today we're gonna to continue looking at Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. The dateline is about AD 55, just 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. What's the backdrop? Corinth is a bustling, very cosmopolitan seaport in Greece. And it would have been quite an exciting place to be, but it had quite a reputation. Uh, there's a phrase that they used to use about Corinth. It says to Corinthianize, which basically means to have promiscuous sex. So it was a society where anything went, anything goes. If we look at Acts 18, we read how Paul sets up this brand new church from scratch in about AD 50. A good number of people became Christians and Paul spent 18 months there discipling them, helping them to understand what it means to follow Jesus and what a good church looks like, you know, job done. Well, not exactly. Just four years later, things were getting very messy in the church at Corinth and the church was being more influenced by society rather than influencing society. And that's our challenge too here at City Hope. We live in a post-Christian secular society and the increasingly dominant culture is anything but Christian and certainly anything goes. So Paul writes this letter to address a whole bunch of problems including about sex, marriage, and relationships. And that's what we're gonna look at today. First up, the Bible is very pro-sex. God thinks it's brilliant. He would, it's his idea. It's not just one of those things you've just gotta do, it should be passionate. And so we get in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, a very graphic love poem describing how passionate God is about you and me. But he thinks it's so important that you just don't do it with anybody. And so he came up with another great idea, marriage. God believes in passionate love, but he also believes in faithfulness. He believes that we shouldn't say, I'll share your bed, but nothing else. He believes that we should share bodies, life, friendship, money, etc., etc. That's marriage. That's faithfulness. He also thinks sex is a great way to build up family and society. And so, in other words, we get children. Unfortunately, the dominant culture in Corinth and in London increasingly is just do it. Don't worry about the consequences. Of course, there's a lot of momentary fun, but there are deep and massive long-term consequences. And who suffers most? Children and women in that order. Half of children today won't be living with both natural parents by the age of 16. And insecurity and instability is bad for kids. And that's affecting our society. You see, in the Bible, God describes himself as a husband and a father. And they're both his values and his role. It's who he is. And therefore there's a huge responsibility laid at the door at the male of the species. For men, for fathers. 
And in the light of this whole discussion, I just want to recommend a book to you. It's called A Better Story, God, Sex, and Human Flourishing. And it's by Glyn Harrison, who was the professor of psychiatry at the University of Bristol. If you're not a reader, look him up online and you can see some of his video seminars. And he prevents a very powerful um, perspective of the extraordinary cultural shifts that are happening in our society today that we're experiencing and the challenges for us as Christians. So do check out that book. As with the Corinthian Christians, our lives at City Hope are very far from perfect. They're messy. Uh, there may be regrets, entanglements, consequences from the past that we either have to live with or work our way through. But we can make choices now about the future. We can make choices now about the future. And we've got two massive advantages. Number one, Jesus said he's with us and will guide us. And number two, you're part of a family here at City Hope. And both want to do you good. As I said earlier, it doesn't matter where we come from, but who we're going to. Nobody can go back and start a new beginning. But anyone can start right now and have and make a new ending. Anyone can start right now and make a new ending. And if there's one thing about making choices for the future, it's easy when things are stable, not easy when things are in crisis. And Paul is writing this letter in the middle of a crisis. So we read in chapter 7, verse 26, because of the present crisis, I think it's good that you remain as you are. Verse 29, what I mean, brothers, the time is short. Verse 31, for this world in its present form is passing away. Now, Paul doesn't spell out what the crisis is, but we know from the New Testament, from the Acts in particular, that Christians were experiencing persecution, opposition, and even death. Although we don't know what the circumstances were, still Paul had to address these issues. And uh, the questions were, should I get married? In this circumstance? Should I stay single? Should I divorce? These are some of the very earthy questions that Paul is addressing in chapter 7. Paul makes no bones about it. He thinks being single is great and thinks everybody should be like him. In verse 7 we read, I wish that all men were as I am. Just think about that for a minute. That would be the end of civilization as we know it. But he continues, he says, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift and another has that. What he's saying is view your current situation as a gift. View your current situation as a gift. And at City Hope, we want to honour each and every person who is single, just like Paul did. Being single is not a lesser state than being married. Some people think that when you're married, you've arrived. That's not the case. You could be fulfilled or unfulfilled being single, just as you could be fulfilled or unfulfilled being married. We're making a big mistake if we think, if only, if only this was my situation, if only I was like that person. Paul says being unmarried actually simplifies the Christian life, so that you can give God your undivided attention. And there'll be many reasons why somebody's not married. That's what they've chosen. Or they may not yet have found the right partner, or they may have lost their partner, or indeed been divorced. And we are a family at City Hope, and that doesn't mean everybody's got 2.4 children and a husband and or wife it means that you belong just as you are so let's pray and support those who are single particularly during lockdown we can go for a walk with somebody in another household or we could text somebody or give somebody a call let's stand in particular with single parents I thank God for people like Arita and Hilda and many others who've been fantastic examples in raising families as single parents with the help of the City Hope 
village. And against the backdrop of an increasingly fragmented and individualistic society, let's pray for lifelong faithful marriages at City Hope because that's always been God's plan. Find ways to encourage people who are married, particularly those who may be going through a, a, a time of struggle. Paul wants the very best for every single person at the church of, at Corinth. You see all the way through the letter, he wants them to flourish. Paul says, make decisions and organize your life so that King Jesus is not an added extra, but number one, and it's for your own good. Verse 35 is our key verse in chapter seven. He says this, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided attention to the Lord. I'll read that again. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided attention to the Lord. God wants you to flourish. He wants to do you good. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be yours as well. And so the main thing is not me, me, me. The main thing is a king. The main thing is the Messiah. The main thing is the lover of our soul, the one who laid down his life for us and rose again, Jesus. A very simple illustration that helps me grasp this is that of a tricycle. All three wheels are vital, but there's only one wheel that guides and directs line of travel and goes before all the others. Everything follows the front wheel. If my desires, if I, my desires, my wants, my emotions end up at the front, uh, as the front wheel, I have a big problem. If I let the king take his rightful place, everything else will follow. It doesn't mean it's going to be an easy ride, but it does mean that we're going to be going in the right direction. In our singleness, in our marriages, in, with our future. Thomas Cramner, the English reformer, said this, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. As followers of Jesus, let's be people who desire him. Let's be people who love him with all our heart, soul, mind, body. Let's look at the choices that we've got both in the present and in the future through the lens of the gospel of Jesus rather than through the world. Let's pray that City Hope will be a family that reflects God's priorities. Ask Jesus to direct your life. Know that his purposes and his plans for you are for good. Lay before him your hopes, your aspirations. Put him first. Seek him first. I'm going to ask Jackie to pray for us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lord, for your word that keeps our feet on the paths of peace. Thank you that your will is always good for us. You always choose what's best for us, Lord God. Thank you for our single brothers and sisters. We pray that they will thrive and flourish and enjoy your abundant life. Lord, will you guard their hearts and help them to make good decisions and good choices. Lord, we thank you for our married couples and we pray that we will uh, joyfully be faithful to one another all the days of our lives. And Lord, will you be with those for whom marriage is a struggle? Will you give them patience and perseverance and strength and put good people around them to help them? And Father, whether we're single or whether we're married, we pray that you will help us to give you our undivided attention, Lord God. We want to put you first because, Lord, no one can love us the way you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jackie. Becky and the crew are now going to sing for us, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And there's one line in there I just want you to pay particular attention to. It says, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Let that 
be your prayer over to Becky. Thanks everyone, what a great service again. Don't forget our prayer room is open after the service, and so go ahead and join in from 11.45 if you would like someone to pray with you. So all that remains is for us to say goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Have a superb week and we'll see you next time. Well, bye and see you tonight at the prayer meeting.
You are good and I dance because you are good and I shout because you are good. You are good, so good to me. My heart will proclaim You are good You are good In the sun or rain My life celebrates You are good You are good And with the cry Because you are good and 